Learn how to use Terraform with Azure in this course from Derek Morgan. Derek is an excellent teacher and he has created many popular courses. Hello and welcome to the Build a Development Environment with Terraform and Azure Resume Foundations Project course. Now you might be wondering what exactly a Resume Foundations Project is. Well, a Resume Foundations Project is a project built to help you Learn the fundamentals of a technology to create your own projects that you can use on your resume. So let's take a look at what we're going to build in this course. In this two hour project centered around Terraform, you're going to use VS Code and deploy an Azure Linux machine along with virtual network, subnet, security groups, etc that will serve as a remote development environment that you can log into directly from VS Code. We'll utilize several Terraform tools and functions such as Terraform State, Format, Replace, Console, Variables, Conditionals, and more. We'll also use Azure Custom Data and a provisioner to bootstrap the virtual machine with Docker and add its connection information to your VS Code SSH configuration file allowing you to modify it for your own projects. Since we'll make heavy use of documentation and highlight the process behind developing a brand new Terraform deployment, you'll have the skills you need to dive deeper into Terraform and add this extremely in-demand skill to your resume. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead, enroll in the course, let's start building so that you can Terraform apply yourself. We're going to open a new project in VS Code, install the Azure CLI, connect to our Azure account, and install a Terraform extension. So, let's get started. First things first, what we want to do is we want to install the Azure CLI. This is going to allow Terraform to authenticate and access the Azure API. So let's go ahead and knock that out. Now I am on a Windows computer. And if we head over here to this link, which is provided in the resources, you'll see we have installation instructions for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So go ahead and choose the operating system you're using and go ahead and install. Now I'm going to be installing on Windows and I'll go ahead and show that process. It's not too complicated for Windows. We just need to download this file and run it. So I'm going to do that. All right, and I'm going to run that file now. All right, all set. Of course, if you're not done, go ahead and pause the video while your installer finishes up. I'm gonna go ahead and click Finish. And now, since I already have VS Code open, I'm just going to close it and reopen it. All right, VS Code has been restarted. I'm going to go ahead and open a terminal. All right, so now what I'm going to do is just run AZ login to get logged into my account. Now for you, you can choose a browser to open and you will log in to Azure and get all signed up. I'm actually going to show the alternate route just in case you have a problem with the browser. So what you can do is use a AZ login dash dash use device code. So I'm going to control C out of this. And again, you don't have to do this if everything worked fine. I just wanted to make sure that we cover all the avenues here. So AZ login, use device code, just like so. And as you can see, we've got a link right here. So I'm going to paste that link in, just like so. And as you can see, I'm already logged into Azure. And then I just need to grab this code and paste it in. There we go and continue. All right, it says we've signed in, let's verify. There we go. And you can also validate by running AZ account show, just like so. All right, so now that we've done that, let's go ahead and add the Terraform extension. Now you can use the official one, but honestly, the official one has some pretty terrible reviews, so I've been using this one here. Let's go ahead and choose that extension and install it. 
But again, you're more than welcome to use any extension you'd like here. And then what we need to do is open a new folder where we'll store our files. So let's go ahead and file, open folder. And I'm just going to hop into my documents. And I'm going to create a new folder. And we'll just call that Terraform Azure, just like so. Go ahead and open that, select folder, and all set. And once again, I'll just make sure that everything is set up for Azure. AZ account show. Still logged in, everything looks good to go. First thing I'm going to do is just create a new file, and we're going to call that main.tf, just like so. Go ahead and open that. And now I'm just going to pull that out of the way and let's take a look at the Azure Docs. Now, as you can see here, we've got our Azure provider and what this provider does is allows Terraform to communicate with the Azure API. That's how Terraform knows how to deploy resources. So as you can see, if you look down, you'll see authenticating to Azure. And the way we're doing it is with the Azure CLI. Of course, you can feel free to read these other options here. Those may work better for your organization, but for us, the Azure CLI works perfectly fine. So this is our configuration that we're going to use for the provider. There's some more stuff down here. We'll get into that very soon, but we're going to start here. Now, as you can see, we've got Terraform and then we've got required providers. So any of the providers we're going to use are specified in this block. So we've got the Azure RM provider. The source here is HashiCorp Azure RM. And then we've got a version. Now this is actually freezing this version to 2.97.0. Your version may be different and that's perfectly fine. Of course, if something does break, you can always revert to this version and please let me know so that I can update the course. Now below that, we then actually specify the provider. Up here is indicating which providers we'll be using within Terraform. And then here is actually how we will do the connection and specify any other options that we may want to specify. Now, as you can see, if you scroll down, we've got all of these arguments and one of them is features, which is required. So even if we don't use anything within the features block because it's required, we still need to include it. As you can see here, it's included with an open set of curly braces. So basically it's an empty map. So as you can see, there are lots of other options that you can use. Feel free to peruse that. But let's go ahead and get coding. Now you can just copy and paste that in. I'm just going to type it out just to get a little practice going. So we're going to start with a Terraform block, open and close some braces, required providers, open and close some braces again. Azure RM is our provider. And then let's provide the source, which equals HashiCorp slash Azure RM. And then version equals, again, in my case, 2.91.0. Now you don't necessarily need to specify this, but it's a good way to ensure that the code always works. So after that, we just provide that configuration block, provider, Azure RM, and that open features block there. So this is all we need here. And of course you can provide more providers. You can even provide two Azure providers if you want. You'll just need to name them differently. And that's how you can potentially use different accounts or different regions or something like that. But in this case, we're going to keep it simple. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and run a First, we'll run a Terraform FMT, and that stands for Terraform Format. And as you can see, that kind of cleaned up our code a little bit, removed some indentations, things like that. So it's a good habit to run Terraform Format anytime you are working with any type of files, especially before you commit to your repositories. All right, so now that we've done that, let's go to the next step, and that is a Terraform init, just like so. As you can see, we're initializing the back end, and the back end is a local back end, which means that our Terraform state where everything is stored will be stored here. All right, everything is successfully initialized. 
Let's take a look at what we've got. We've got the .terraform directory here. This is actually where the provider is stored. And this is a compiled file. So this is actually a compiled Go file, or in Windows case, an .exe file, as you can see. And that is what is used to communicate with the API of Azure. And then what we have is our Terraform lock.hcl. And as you can see, this can constrain the version that we use. You typically want to commit this to your repository. So even if this version isn't set, this lock.hcl will maintain that version to ensure that your code always runs. Now, if you decide to upgrade that provider, you may want to just delete this file or modify the version. So just keep that in mind. Now, if you were paying attention, you may have noticed I accidentally left an S off the end of features. So I want to illustrate a point here. Terraform init is not interested in anything else except for provider related stuff. So basically I could put whatever I want to down here. And if I run a Terraform init, it has no problems whatsoever. But if I change the provider and accidentally use the wrong provider name or a wrong resource name, which we will look into, it will fail. So do keep that in mind. Init is not sufficient to test your code. You will need to run a plan, which we will cover soon. So to fix this provider, let's go ahead and make sure that's fixed and make sure that feature is plural, just like so features. Perfect. So that should be good to go. So now let's take a look at the resource group documentation. Now, as you can see, we've got some notes here. None of these are going to affect us, but do be aware that whenever you see notes in the documentation like this, it's probably a great idea to read them as sometimes they will indicate some very, very big issues that you might encounter and how to solve them. So now let's scroll down here. We've got our example usage. As you can see, we've got a resource here. So just like we have provider here, this is a resource. And this resource is Azure RM underscore resource group. Now this cannot change. This indicates the type of resource that you are deploying. So you want to make sure you use the right name for that resource as Terraform will have no idea what you're trying to deploy if you don't use the right name. Now this is an alias. The following here can be anything you want for the most part. You have to adhere to some grammar rules, but for the most part, it can be just about anything you want. And this is how you will reference this resource within Terraform. Now Azure doesn't know anything about this alias but Terraform does. This is how it's stored in the state. So after that, we've got our arguments, we've got a name, and then this is Azure specific, location, Azure specific. And then also we can pass in some tags, Azure specific. And now once you create this, you can actually go into the state using several different methods that we'll cover. And you can also attain the ID of the resource once it's deployed. There will be no ID that you can find until, of course, it is deployed within Azure. So let's bring the code back over here and let's go ahead and start coding. In fact, what I'm going to do, scroll up and let's just copy this block right here. And we'll paste it in just to help prevent any type of typos since I am very prone to those. So we've got a resource, Azure RM Resource Group. And let's just call that mtc-rg, just like so. Now the name, since this is actually in Azure, we're gonna make that a little more specific in this case. We'll just call it mtc-resources. And this is also to illustrate that these can be different. Now the location I'm going to use is going to be east, US, just like so. And then below that, I'm going to specify some tags. So tags equals, open and close some curly braces, and let's just give it an environment tag. So the environment equals dev. We're not really going to be doing much with these tags in this course, but of course for billing purposes or any type of other resource management, it's nice to know what environment your resources are deployed to. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and control S. Now let's run a Terraform 
FMT once again, clean things up. As you can see, it kind of pulled that environment back a little bit. And then let's run a Terraform plan, just like so. All right, so that was a successful plan. And what this is doing is showing us what is going to be built if we run a Terraform apply. So as you can see, we've got our plus signs for create. There are other signs, but right now we're not changing anything. So you can see that we're creating this new resource. And then under that, you've got the arguments that we're passing in. And as you can see, we've got the ID known after apply, which means we will know that as soon as this is deployed to Azure. So let's go ahead and deploy that. Let's go ahead and run a Terraform apply and hit enter. All right, as you can see, it ran a plan again. And then it asks us if we would like to perform these actions, if we'd like to continue. So yes, we would definitely like to continue. Now in the future, we will use the auto approve flag just to skip that because we are running a plan between all of this. So we don't need to get another confirmation. But generally speaking, when running from the CLI in production, it's probably a good idea to have this extra step just to ensure you don't make any mistakes. So we'll go ahead, enter that yes and hit enter. And give that a little bit of time and it should be deployed here shortly. All right, apply complete resources, one added, zero changed, zero destroyed. Perfect. Let's go take a look in the Azure console. Going to refresh here. Just going to click up here to the left and I'm going to click on resource groups. All right, and this is the first time I've logged in this account, so we've got a lot of pop-ups here. Let's get rid of those. As you can see, sometimes resource groups take a little bit of time to show up, but once I refresh, here they are, mtc-resources. So if we open it, we can see all sorts of other information about it, so that is excellent. We're going to set the groundwork for our deployment by deploying a virtual network. In order to do that, We'll also need to learn how to reference attributes of other resources. So let's get started. All right, so we've got the documentation, which is where we always start, right here. Now there are some notes here, and eventually these may be deprecated, but for right now, they are fairly important. Some of the demos and examples are going to show inline subnets. We're actually not going to do that. We're going to specify our subnet as a separate resource. That gives us more control over the resource itself, how it relates to things, its dependencies, and lots of other little benefits that you'll see as you start to build your own larger deployments. So as you can see here, this note covers that standalone subnet resource and some of the pitfalls. So let's just scroll down to this example here. Now we're not going to use a lot of this, as you know, as I just mentioned, the subnets are in line, so we're not going to do that. We're not going to worry about the DNS servers. We're going to keep it pretty simple with just name, resource group name, location, address space, and tags. Now, one thing you can take a look at here, the resource group name references the resource group. As you can see, Azure RM resource group dot example dot name. So it is a resource Azure RM resource group dot example dot name. So we've got the resource type, the resource alias that we provided to it, and then one of the attributes, all using a dot syntax. And then the same is specified with location. So let's go ahead and do this ourselves. So I'm gonna roll this back over and let's get to coding. So we will specify a resource just like so. Once again, in quotes for the resource type, Azure RM, virtual network, just like so. And I'm just going to give it an alias of mtc-vn and then open and close our braces. And then within here, we need to specify a name and that we'll just call mtc network. Again, I'm being a little more detailed with my name within the resource itself, but the alias doesn't need to be as long. So the name mtc network, then we provide the resource group name, just like so. So that's going to be Azure RM 
and we can actually take a shortcut. I'm just going to press down and tab right there to tab complete that. So Azure RM resource group, just like this, Azure RM resource group dot MTC dash RG, which is this here dot name. Now you could also just specify MTC resources if you wanted to, but you don't want to define the same thing in multiple places because if we were to change MTC resources, we'd have to change it in every resource that references it. Now, another reason why it's important to reference resources by their resource address instead of by hard coding them is because this creates an implicit dependency. Basically, now this network will not deploy before this resource group has been created. In the same whenever we destroy, it will not destroy this resource group until this virtual network is destroyed. So by referencing this resource group from the virtual network, we tell Terraform that this virtual network is dependent on this resource group. So now let's specify a location. And that's going to be very similar to this. So I'm actually just going to copy this, paste it down here and add dot location which again is defined here as East US. And then what we want to do is specify the address space, also known as a CIDR block. The address space is, and this is actually a list. You can specify multiple address spaces here, but we're just going to use one. We're going to use 10.123.0.0 slash 16. And if you're not familiar with subnets, I strongly recommend you review them. Feel free to reach out if you'd like any tips or where to start. And then under that, let's add some tags. I'm actually going to give a little bit of space between my details and the tags here. And once again, environment equals dev. And you could copy and paste that too if you want to. All right, I think that's everything. Let's go ahead and run our Terraform format. And after that, let's run our Terraform plan. Okay, we're seeing a lot of green here. That is good. We've got one resource to add. Looks like everything we specified, as you can see, we'll also have access to information about the DNS servers after apply, the GUID, the ID, and the subnets here, but possibly after you apply. So that's great. Let's go ahead and get this network deployed. So Terraform apply. And as I said, we're just going to use a dash auto approve here. And if you want to see everything else, you can actually do a dash help. And you can see lots of great options here. But right now we're just going to focus on applying. So Terraform apply dash auto approve. Feel free to pause the video while yours is applying and then come on back whenever it is finished. All right, one added, zero change, zero destroyed. Let's go take a look. Here I am in my resources group here. I'm actually just going to go back to home real quick. Click over here to the left, just so we can see how to get to it the long way. I'm gonna click on virtual networks. And there it is, mtc-network. Everything looks like it's here. We've got our address space. DNS servers, location, everything looks great. So wonderful. And we're going to take a slight detour from building to dive into probably one of the most important Terraform concepts, the Terraform state. So let's go ahead and get stated. I mean, let's get started. All right, so here we are. As you can see, we've got all of our resources that we've deployed so far. And you may have noticed this terraform.state file and this terraform.tf state backup file. Let's take a look in them and see what we're looking at. So if you open it up, and let me go ahead and preface with under very, very, very few circumstances should you ever modify this state manually. There are specialized commands for making state changes and things. So for the most part, one, you probably shouldn't have direct access to it. It should be stored remotely. But two, don't go around and start changing things in this state. It's not the right way to manage your resources. With that being said, let's take a look. As you can see, each state has a version. It specifies the Terraform version, 
It's got a serial number, a lineage, a lot of really good information to help you understand which state you're dealing with. And every time the state is modified, it actually creates a backup. As you can see here, it's got a serial of one. So once we run a Terraform apply or destroy again, the Terraform state will be backed up with this Terraform state information and a new Terraform.tf state will be created. So as you look through our state here, you can see a lot of very familiar attributes. Right here, we've got our Azure RM resource group with a name. Then you've got the provider there also. And then under that, we've got ID, location, name, tags, etc., etc. And as you scroll down, you'll see we also have our virtual network here. So that's pretty cool. And all of that, of course, is exactly what was deployed within Azure. So let's take a look at a better way to see what we need to see in our state. Because again, typically speaking, you're not going to store your state locally. You're going to send it off to some sort of other storage. Some people with AWS store it in S3. You can store it in Terraform's cloud. You can store it in services such as Spacelift and more. So let's go ahead. I'm going to close this file. Let's bring this up just a little bit. And let's go ahead and run a Terraform state list. All right, so that's an easy way to see all of the resources we have. And then if we want more details about what's in those resources, we can run a Terraform state show, and then we just utilize one of these resources. So I can just copy this, paste it in and hit enter. And there we go. So now we get the information from that resource. And now if we want to see the entire state, we actually just run a Terraform show. So keep that in mind. Terraform show will show you all of the state, as you can see here. And then Terraform state show is how you view specific resources, just like so. So if we take a look at the docs here, there's actually a good bit that you can read through. I strongly suggest you get very, very familiar with it. We're actually going to be going through a few of the other features of the state throughout the course. But this was a good quick run through of how to utilize a state. And once again, we'll be checking in every so often to make some modifications to that state. We're going to check out a command almost as fun to use as Terraform apply, but much more fun to say. Now that command is Terraform destroy. Now, if we take a look at the docs, we can actually see that a few things have changed since Terraform came out. Originally, Terraform Destroy was the proper way to do this, and it still works. As you can see, Terraform Destroy followed by Options. This is an alias for Terraform Apply dash destroy. Now, you can also run a Terraform Plan dash destroy, which of course will not perform the destruction. It will just let you know what it's going to do. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now, of course, what Terraform Destroy does here is destroy everything that you've created. But let's take a look at a few things first. First, what I'm going to do is just run a Terraform state list. Let's just take a look. We have two objects here. As you know, we've deployed both of those. And then if I run a Terraform plan dash destroy, as you can see, we've got zero to add, zero to change, and two to destroy. And if you scroll up, you can see that everything has this little red dash next to it, indicating that it's going to be deleted. So if you ever see that red dash, that means that that resource is going to be deleted. All right, so let's go ahead and take a quick look. Let's look at our terraform.tf state. Just like so, as you can see, we've got a serial of three here, version of four, we've got a lineage and all of this good stuff. Let's take a look at the tfstate.backup. Serial is one there, version is four. Let's run this Terraform destroy and see what changes. So I'm going to run Terraform apply dash destroy, or you can just run Terraform destroy if you'd like. Let's go ahead and run that. I'm gonna pull this up a little bit. All right, and just like Terraform apply, it's asking for a yes or no here. You can also use an auto approve. So I'm just going to type yes to destroy everything.
All right, all set. As you can see, it took it a while to delete that resource group. Let's take a look at the TF state and TF state backup again. Here is the TF state. As you can see, there is nothing in here anymore. And the serial has incremented to six. Now, if we take a look at the TF state backup, here you go. This was our old TF state. So now, if you ever needed to replace the state, or you made it a big mistake, or something went wrong with the state, somehow the state got corrupted, you have this backup right here. You can delete this TF state and rename this one to continue utilizing what you had before. All right, so that's all for this lesson. Go ahead if you'd like and run that Terraform Apply Auto Approve real quick to put everything back to where it was. And we're going to deploy a subnet into our virtual network. This way, we have an IP address space that can be used by our virtual machines. So, let's get started. So, as usual, let's take a peek at our Azure RM subnet resource here. It's got a very similar note here that we saw on our virtual network resource that indicated that these subnets can be deployed in line with the virtual network, but in our case and most other cases, it's better to deploy it separately from the virtual network. Now, as you can see here, it's actually listing our resource group and virtual network, which we've already done. So all we need to do is deploy the Azure RM subnet just like this. Now, as you can see, there are several arguments here. We're not going to use all of them. And if you continue scrolling, you've got all sorts of great little notes here, most of which do not pertain to us and this deployment. But again, it's very important to read those and understand what you might need to know for future deployments. All right, so now that we've taken a look at that, these are the following attributes that will be exported. ID name, resource group name, name, prefix, prefixes. And again, right now we don't need most of that, but some of this we're going to be reaching out to later. So anyway, let's get building. All right, so back in the terminal, we'll start a new resource, and that's going to be an Azure RM subnet, just like so. And we'll just call that MTC subnet. Keep it nice and simple. And then the name, we'll just call this MTC subnet. But I will say that in future deployments, you might want to add a one or a random string to that. But in this case, we're going to still keep it simple. And then resource group name is what we need to supply second. And that's going to be our Azure RM resource group, which I'm going to tab to complete dot MTC dash RG dot name, just like so. Now after that, we need to provide a virtual network name, just like so. And that's going to be our virtual network, which is going to be Azure RM. And if you just scroll down here, you can see the virtual network. And of course, you can also see it and copy paste from right here if you'd like. Virtual network dot MTC dash VN. And we're going after the name here which is MTC network, as you can see there. And we're just going to use name. So this name here references the MTC dash network. Perfect. And then after that, we need to provide the address prefixes. And that just like above is actually going to be in a list, which means there are brackets on the side and it can accept multiple arguments. Now we're only going to use one prefix here. But, of course, if you needed to provide multiple, you'd be able to. Generally speaking, if you see a plural name here for the argument, that's expecting a list, so you will be using these brackets. So that's going to be 10.123, and we'll just use .1.0 slash 24, just like so. All right, so that's all we've got to do for this subnet. Let's go ahead and make sure that I coded everything out right. We'll run a Terraform FMT, which aligns some things for us. And then we're going to run a Terraform plan. I'll drag this up some. All right, one to add, zero to change, zero to destroy. It looks like everything we asked for is there. The ID, of course, will be known after apply just as it has been before. 
the name MTC subnet, resource group name MTC resources, and virtual network name MTC network. As you can see, those were populated just fine by referencing the name of these resources. All right, perfect. So go ahead and run a Terraform apply dash auto approve. All right, apply complete. Everything is looking good. If we run a Terraform state list, we can see that our subnet .mtc subnet has now been deployed. And of course, you can also go to your Azure portal. I'll go home. I'm going to click into my MTC resources just like so. Then we'll click on the network. And within here, you can see subnets on the left. And there is our MTC subnet. All right, perfect we're going to add a very important resource to our deployment, the security group. So let's get started. First, let's take a look at the docs over here. And as you can see, we have another note. Now with the security group, you can actually define your security group rules in line just like this or as separate resources. Now to keep things consistent, we're going to deploy our security group rule as a separate resource instead of adding it in line. This will make maintaining our security group rules a lot easier and allow us to make deploys and changes without any real unexpected consequences. If you scroll down, you can actually see a security group rule can be configured both inline and via the separate resource. We have to explicitly set it to an empty slice to remove it. Honestly, that's just a little bit weird. I don't like that. I'd much rather just remove the rule entirely as a separate resource versus having to manipulate our whole security group. So this is going to make things a lot cleaner and easier to manage. So let's go ahead and get started with that. As you can see, the security group is actually pretty simple. Name, location, resource group name, and some tags. So let's go ahead and get that done, and then we will add the separate rule. So I'll bring the code back over. Let's go ahead and get that going. Resource, Azure, RM, Network, Security, Group. MTC, and we'll just go SG, just like that. Open and close our braces. Name equals MTC SG. Location equals Azure RM. And we're going to be using the location in our resource group. So I'll just select that. Dot MTC RG dot location. Once again, remember, in our resource group, we have the location right here. So we're just using Azure RM resource group, mtc-rg location to get our proper location. And after that, we've got a resource group name. And that's going to be Azure RM. Select that resource group there. Dot mtc-rg dot name, just like so. And then after that, let's add a tag. Tags equals environment. Need to spell that right. Environment equals dev. All right, perfect. I'm going to control S to save that. And then let's go ahead and add our resource group rule. So I'll move this code out of the way and I'm going to select the Azure RM Network Security Rule resource. And if you take a look, Azure RM Network Security Rule example, you've got all of these items here that need to be filled in, and then you reference the resource group name and the network security group name. So I'm going to cheat just a little bit here and copy this so we're not typing this whole thing. I type fast, but not that fast. Let's go ahead and bring it back over. Let's paste that in. And now take a look at the things that need to change. First, using example is not very descriptive. Let's go ahead and call this mtc-dev-rule, basically indicating this allows for developer access. 
And then the name, I'm just going to call MTC dev rule, just like so. Priority at 100 is fine. Obviously, if you start adding more rules, you might need to change those priorities. All right, and then of course, direction here, we are not worried about outbound. Outbound is going to work for us. We need to set inbound because right now we're trying to allow access to our instances and subnets, not out from it. Access allow. Now the protocol is currently TCP, which actually would work for most of our cases. I'm just going to go ahead and replace that with an asterisk to allow for ICMP or anything else we need. And the same with source port range, destination port range, source address prefix. Now, this right now is allowing anyone. Quite frankly, I don't want anyone seeing my IP address. It doesn't change enough for me to want to do that. But I would definitely recommend you add your IP address here. And to do that, you can go to any IP address finding website or just check your router or whatever you need to do to get your public IP address and just add that here. And you would do it with this syntax ending with a slash 32. But once again, I'm going to leave this as an asterisk. And then as far as resource group name, that would be mtc-rg. And network security group name, as you remember, we made that up here, mtc-sg. Just like so. All right, that was a lot of stuff there. Let's go ahead and run a Terraform FMT. Let's run a Terraform plan and see how many typos I made. All right, fantastic. That's actually kind of impressive. Everything looks like it's ready to deploy. We've got our security group and our security group rule. So let's go ahead and run a Terraform apply dash auto approve. All right, everything applied successfully. We can run a Terraform state list. And we see all of our fun new resources there. Everything is good to go. We're going to associate our brand new security group with our subnet so it can be actually used to protect it. So let's get started. As you can see here, we have our Azure RM subnet network security group association. Quite a mouthful. Luckily, it's not that long of a resource. It's actually very, very straightforward and very simple. So let's go ahead and just knock that out. I'm actually going to copy right here from the docs. Of course, if you don't have the page open, feel free to just type it in or pull it from the code downloaded from the official repository of this course. And I am going to paste that in. So we have our resource, Azure RM Subnet Network Security Group Association. And we'll just call that something like MTC-SGA. Nice and simple to say. And then here we have our Azure RM Subnet. And that was MTC-Subnet.ID. Then here we need to specify our Network Security Group ID. And that was mtc-sg, if I remember correctly, let me scroll up to verify. Yes, right here, mtc-sg. All right, perfect, and we are referencing the IDs of both, as you can see, ID and ID. And that is literally all we have to do. I know that is a relief coming from the last few longer lessons. Let's go ahead and run our Terraform FMT. Let's run a Terraform plan. All right, as you can see, one to add. Everything is looking good. ID known after apply, network security group ID, which it found, and subnet ID, which it found. And that will allow our network security group to protect our subnet. So let's go ahead and run our Terraform apply, auto approve. All right, everything applied successfully. We're going to give our future virtual machine a way to the internet by creating a public IP. So let's get started. All right, so here we are with the Azure RM public IP. Pretty straightforward. We've got a name, a resource group name, location, allocation method. Here you'll see static. We're going to be using dynamic and then some tags. You scroll down, you can see we've got a lot of different options here. 
but the only one we're really concerned with is the allocation method since we're going to be using dynamic instead of static. All right, feel free to peruse those a little bit, but let's go ahead and get started with our coding. So I'm actually going to just copy this here. Let's go ahead and add that. Just like so, Azure RM public IP. In our case, we're going to name this MTC-IP. We'll keep it very simple. And then the name, once again, let's keep it simple with MTC-IP. And I do want to call attention to this again. In the case of this deployment, it is a very, very static deployment. There's not going to be a lot changing, not going to be a lot adding. This is really just a way for us to deploy a simple and quick development environment. So we're not going to have multiple IPs necessarily or multiple security groups or whatever. Now, if you do anticipate adding things, you're going to want to make sure you add either a number to this or some other string or even use a random ID resource, which Terraform offers to append some sort of random string to the end of these so that if you do deploy multiple, you don't have overlaps. So just keep that in mind. But in our case, we're going to keep it simple. Then for the resource group name, let's go ahead and add our mtc-rg like we have before. And of course the location, mtc-rg, and we're going to change this allocation method to dynamic, just as we saw. And for tags, let's go ahead and just set it to dev. All right. Perfect, I think that should be everything. Let's go ahead and run our Terraform FMT. Then let's run our Terraform plan. All right, everything looks good. As you can see, we've got our dynamic there, MTC IP, everything is looking correct as far as I can tell. Now, one thing to note, even though it says there's an IP address known after apply, it will not be known after apply. This is kind of a strange thing about the way Azure works. The public IP, when set as dynamic, will not show up until it's attached to something and used. So just keep that in mind. All right, I'm going to run our Terraform apply, auto approve. All right, apply complete, perfect. Go ahead and run our Terraform state list. And then what I'm going to do is grab this IP right here and I'm going to copy that, control C for me. Let's run a Terraform state show and paste that in. There we go. And as you can see, we do not have an IP address here. But once we deploy our other resources, we will be able to extract that IP address and use it in the future. We're going to create the network interface that we will attach to our virtual machine in order to provide network connectivity. This NIC will receive its public IP address from the IP address we just created. So let's get started. All right, so here is our network interface. If we scroll down, we can see it right here. And as you can see, it kind of gets our usual suspects, the name, location, resource group name. We then get the IP configuration under that. And we've got a name for that, subnet ID and private IP address allocation. But as you can see, we don't have public IP address listed here, which is something that is very important to us. So if you scroll down, you can actually see a public IP address dot ID right here. So we're going to add that and reference our public IP with that attribute. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, we're going to type this one out again just to give us a little more practice typing this. We'll use a resource, Azure RM underscore network underscore interface. And let's go ahead and call that MTC Nick, just like so. Then under that, let's give it that name. And that's just going to be MTC Nick location equals Azure RM. We're starting to get a lot of resources here, as you can see. But let's scroll down and find that resource group and tab that in dot MTC dash RG dot location, just like so. Then under that, we've got our resource group name. 
and that's going to be Azure RM. Once again, resource group dot name. All right, and now we need to provide that IP configuration block. So IP underscore configuration. Open and close those braces. Name, and we'll just call that internal, just like the docs say. Subnet ID equals Azure RM subnet dot MTC dash subnet dot ID. Under that, we then provide our private IP address allocation, and that's going to be dynamic. We're not really worried about it in this case, what the private IP address is that our instance gets. And then we provide the public IP address ID. And that is Azure RM public IP dot MTC dash IP dot ID. And then let's add a tag down here for good measure. Tags equals environment equals dev just like that all right everything is looking good at first glance let's run a terraform fmt everything is good so far let's run that terraform plan all right as you can see on the resource group i actually left out a very important part of that dot mtc dash rg dot name as you can see, it gave me the line number and everything. Pretty easy to find where the error was and how to troubleshoot it. All right, so let's run that Terraform plan again. Excellent. Everything is looking good. We've got a lot of green plus signs here. These network interface cards are a little bit complicated. But that all looks great, so let's go ahead and run a Terraform Apply, Auto Approve. Apply Complete, Resources 1 Added, 0 Changed, 0 Destroyed. So if we run a Terraform State List, we've got our NIC there. And if we run a Terraform State Show, add that to the end. As you can see, we have a private IP address right there, but I'm not seeing a public IP address yet. Let's go ahead and run a Terraform state list once again. Let's grab that MTC IP public IP, run another Terraform state show, add that. And still no IP address we're going to create an SSH key pair. This will be used by the Linux VM resource we created so that we can SSH into it later. So let's get started. All right, as you can remember from the docs, we've got the admin SSH key right here. So that's all we have to do. We just have to create the key first. So let's head back into our terminal actually. Let's go ahead and run an SSH keygen dash T RSA. We're going to create an RSA key pair. All right, and I want to save this users Derek dot SSH. And again, this is Windows, which is why this might look a little bit different, but you'll want to just save it in the same path that's illustrated here. We're just going to rename it. So slash. I'll just name mine MTC Azure Key, just like so. Not going to bother with the passphrase there. And we're all set. So if I run an ls home slash dot ssh, you can see my MTC Azure Key and MTC Azure Key dot pub are there ready to go. Perfect. So go ahead and clear my screen there. And then what I want to do is add that key pair, and I'm actually going to put that above this OS disk just to keep it consistent with the documentation, but it really doesn't matter as long as what's within the MTC VM block. So admin SSH key, username equals admin user, 
as we remembered before. And public key equals. And now we're going to use a Terraform function. So just like any other programming construct, it basically is the name of the function followed by parentheses. So we're going to use the file function. And what the file function does is reads a file and substitutes its contents for the value here. So what we'll use is we'll use our MTC Azure key dot pub since it wants the public key right here and we're going to read that using the file function. Make sure you wrap that in quotes. So file is going to pull the contents out of this MTC Azure key dot pub and insert those into this argument here. So it's going to fill this out for us. Now if you want to check out the docs, you can check them out here pretty straightforward as you can see. You basically just pass the path into the file function. And there are also some other functions, FileBase64, which we may look into very soon, file exists, and template file. All right, so now that we have done that, we now have a way into our instance. So now let's go ahead and apply and make sure that we can log into our instance. So I'm going to run my Terraform format once again to clean all of that up. Then I'm going to run Terraform plan. Let's make sure everything is looking good. All right, beautiful. As you can see, one to add. Everything is looking good. As you can see here, the file function did exactly what it was supposed to do and added this here doc syntax to the beginning and end of it. So that is great. Everything is looking good. So let's go ahead and run a Terraform apply. Auto approve. All right, all set, everything applied correctly, which is just wonderful. So now let's go and see if we can find that IP address. Let's just run once again a Terraform state list. And we've got our brand new virtual machine right here. Go ahead and copy that. And then Terraform state show and paste that in. And if we scroll up here, we can see we've got our public IP address for our instance right here. Perfect. Go ahead and copy that. Let's clear the screen and then let's SSH I and pass in that MTC Azure key that we had. Admin user was the username we specified at and paste that IP address in. All right, you may have had a confirmation screen. Go ahead and click yes if you did. Otherwise, here we are all logged in. And if I run an LSB underscore release dash A, we can see we are now within our Ubuntu instance. All right, perfect. So I'm going to exit out of that. We're going to utilize the custom data argument to bootstrap our instance and install the Docker engine. This will allow us to have a Linux VM instance deployed with Docker ready to go for all of our development needs. So, let's get started. All right, first of all, what I want to do is create a new file. And we're just going to call that customdata.tpl. Now, TPL is the extension we typically use for template files. We're not going to make this necessarily a template file, but just for consistency's sake, we're going to use that here just in case you'd like to eventually add some variables. But for right now, let's go ahead and paste in the code provided in the lesson. Should be a bash script. Just like so, and what this is going to do is install all of the dependencies necessary to install Docker on our machine. So go ahead and save that and feel free to close that tab. And then what I want to do is add the custom data argument. And I'm just going to go ahead and put that up here near the top. So custom data equals. Now remember how I said we'd be using the FileBase64 function soon? Well, this is where we're going to use it. As you can see, the FileBase64 function is very much like the file function. 
But what it does is it encodes it in base64, which is what the custom data field for Azure is expecting. So let's go ahead and file base64, open and close some parents there. And we're going to pass in custom data.tpl, just like so. And of course, if this was not in this directory, you would specify the directory where it could be found. But since it's in this directory, we don't need to specify any slashes or anything like that. All right, perfect. So that's actually all we've got to do there as far as coding goes. Let's go ahead and run our Terraform FMT. And then let's run a Terraform plan. All right, perfect. Now we've got something a little bit different this time around. We've got one to add, zero to change, one to destroy. So this isn't changed because custom data requires the VM to be redeployed for it to be read. So it's going to destroy our instance and replace it with a new one. As you can see here, custom data forces replacement. Now another cool thing you can see is sensitive value. Certain arguments can be dedicated as sensitive and custom data is one of those. This way it does not show up here. Now it can still show up in your state and that data of course is still in this file, but it's not going to show up right here for everyone to see in your terminal. All right, so perfect. This is exactly what we want. Let's go ahead and run a Terraform apply. Auto approve, just like so. All right, apply complete. As you saw, there was a pretty long destruction process, but everything looks to be up. Let's go ahead and see if we can log in now. So we're going to need to get that IP address again. So let's run our Terraform state list, and we'll just grab that virtual machine right there, and Terraform state show. Paste that in. I'll scroll up a bit, and there it is, a brand new fresh IP address. So let's go ahead, and I just ran a control R there, and I'm gonna start typing SSH. That saves me a lot of typing right there. If you press control R and search for that SSH command, that should help you out. Otherwise, feel free to type it out manually again. Paste in that new IP address and type yes. All right, we are in our brand new VM. Let's see what happens. Let's go ahead and run a docker dash dash version. Bam, perfect. So now we have docker installed on our brand new VM ready to go. We're going to install the remote SSH extension in VS Code, which will allow VS Code to open a remote terminal in our VM and then we're going to take a look at the configuration scripts we're going to use to insert the VM host information, such as the IP address, into our SSH config file that VS Code uses to connect to those instances. So, let's get started. So first up, I'm going to click on extensions here, and I'm going to type remote SSH, just like so, and I'm going to click install. All right, that is all installed for me, perfect. So then let's take a quick look at it. Let's open the command palette, and as you can see, mine's already there, but you can also start typing remote SSH. And just to see how things work, if you click on add new SSH host, and let's just say SSH admin at admin.com or whatever, let's go ahead and hit enter. You can see you've actually got options potentially to configure different files. Go ahead and click on this first one. We want this location to be within our SSH directory. So click on that. And if you open the config, you can see I've actually got a lot here. You can see the format we're looking at. We're looking at a host, host name, user, and identity file, just like so. So what we're going to want to do is extract that information from our instance and insert it into this configuration file. So let's take a look at how our script is going to do that. Let's go ahead and create a new file. And depending on which operating system you're using, 
Let's go ahead and create the file necessary. So since I'm on Windows, I will use windows-ssh-script.tpl, just like so. And within that file, I'm going to copy in the script you can find in the course resources. So what this is going to do is add the host, hostname, user, and identity file to that file that we specified. Now, as you can see, you've got this interpolation syntax here, and what this is doing is essentially dictating that these are variables. And those variables will be passed in using the template file function, which we're going to cover very, very soon. So go ahead and save that. And then I'm also going to create the Linux one so you can see that. So Linux SSH script.tpl. And of course, this also works for Mac as well. So the Linux script is just like this. You're basically catting in the same type of stuff to our SSH config location. All right. So perfect. So now we see exactly what's going to be used to add the information to that script. We've seen the script and we've installed our SSH extension. So coming up, we're going to start prepping our code to add this information so that we can connect to our host using VS Code. We're going to utilize a provisioner to configure the VS code on our local terminal to be able to SSH into our remote VM. Now, a provisioner is not something you want to use for every deployment. Unlike other resources, a provisioner's success or failure will not be recorded or managed by state. So if something goes wrong, that's just too bad. There is no rollback or any other way to manage it other than just running it again. While this is not great for configuring remote instances, it's perfectly fine for something like this, just adding information to a config file on our local terminal. This is a lightweight operation that doesn't affect the overall success of the deployment if something were to go wrong. So generally speaking, if you need something simple to do, use a provisioner. If you are configuring a remote instance, it's usually best to either use user data, custom data, or another type of application such as Ansible. But anyway, let's get started. So let's take a look over here. First up, we've got our provisioners. And as you can see here, as I was hinting at, provisioners are a last resort. Now, if you scroll down, you can see there's a lot of stuff that you can do other than provisioners. And one of those is what we did, custom data. But if you keep scrolling down, there's actually a lot of great information about using provisioners. And one of the most important things here is the usage of self. Within a provisioner, you can just specify self and that will extract whatever attribute you need from what you're deploying. So if you need a private IP or a public IP, you just specify self, which simplifies the code. And then of course, you've also got creation time provisioners, which is the default. And then you've got destroy time provisioners as well. Destroy time provisioners will perform an action whenever you destroy the script. So just keep that in mind. Definitely read over this as provisioners can be very useful as long as you use them sparingly and with caution. So let's go ahead and set up that provisioner. Now that provisioner is going to be set up within the Azure RM Linux virtual machine block. So let's just head down here above the tags. I just like having the tags last for some reason. You specify provisioner and then you need to specify the type of provisioner and you have local exec and remote exec. Again, remote exec I would use very sparingly. Better to use user data or to use Ansible or some other better tool. But this is a local exec provisioner, which means it'll be running locally. And again, lightweight doesn't cause any disaster if something goes wrong with this provisioner. So then what we need to do is provide a command. So let's go ahead and provide that command. That command is actually going to be one of these scripts. And to specify one of these scripts and pass in the variables, we're going to use what's called a template file function. So if you check out the template file function here, you specify template file, just like you did the file function, pass in the path to the file, and then you pass in the variables. 
So there's a lot of good stuff here that kind of dives into that. Let's go ahead and see how that's going to look for our deployment. So we're going to use the template file function, just like so. And then we need to pass in for me the windows-ssh-script.tpl. And then I need to pass in the variables. And that's going to be in a block of curly braces. So what we want to pass in is the host name. And that's going to be self.public underscore IP underscore address, which is how you access the public IP address of this instance within state. So if we take a look at the Terraform TF state, and as you can see here, public underscore IP underscore address. So that's what we want. So self.public underscore IP underscore address is going to give us that. And then the user is going to be admin user, just like so in quotes. We then need to pass in our identity file. And that is going to be located in that home directory, SSH slash, in my case, MTC Azure key. And of course, that is our private key, so do keep that in mind. And then after that, what we need to do is specify an interpreter. So what the interpreter is doing is basically dictating whether we're using PowerShell or Bash or whatever shell we're using to run this script. And in our case, we're using PowerShell if you're using Windows. So for me, it will be PowerShell and then comma dash command, all in quotes. Now, if you're using Linux or a Mac, your interpreter will be bash comma dash C, just like so. So this is your interpreter if you were using Linux or Mac. But I'm going to delete that from mine. All right, that should be everything. Let me take a look at my script here. Hostname, user identity file. Hostname, user identity file all have been defined. So everything looks good there. So now let's see if this works. So what I want to do, and remember, everything right now has been deployed. If you want the same result I get, which is going to hit a little snag, go ahead and deploy before you do this. Otherwise, just watch and you'll see how I handle it. All right, and before we go further, as you can see, I've actually made a couple of typos, unfortunately. This keyboard seems to be failing on me. So I've gone ahead and corrected those. Let's go ahead and run a Terraform plan and see if I missed anything else. All right, so here is the snag I anticipated. As you can see, no changes. But we made a pretty big change. That's a lot of typing in our resource here. A provisioner does not get picked up by the state, remember? So it doesn't know that anything has changed. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of this instance. We need to destroy it and reapply it. And there are a lot of ways to do that. But the best way to do it is just to replace it. This used to be called tainting a resource, and I guess HashiCorp didn't like that word, so they've changed it to the replace flag. So let's go ahead and utilize that. So first, Terraform state list. Let's go ahead and copy our MTC VM right there, and then run a Terraform apply dash replace and then paste in that resource. All right, so as you can see, using that replace flag replaces our virtual machine, which will then run our provisioner. So let's go ahead and say yes to this. All right, so we have an apply complete. Let's go ahead and see if this worked. So I'm going to head up to view, command palette, and I'm going to select remote SSH connect to host. Of course, if you don't have that, go ahead and start typing remote SSH. And if we scroll down here, 20.121.205.65, let's see if that is it. So I clicked on it. We're going to select Linux. I would like to continue. This is a very good sign. 
All right, we're logged into something, MTC VM. Now I've only spun up one VM, so this has got to be it. Let's Docker version. Does not appear to have been installed yet. So we'll give it a little bit of time and then we will see. All right, it took a little bit of time, but guess what? Docker is now installed. Everything is working perfectly and we now have an awesome little remote terminal directly to our instance so we can start developing. And we're going to take a look at Terraform data sources. Now, data sources are ways that we can query items from the provider, in this case Azure API, and utilize it within our code. Although we don't really need it since it's already available in our state file, we're going to query the public IP we're using just to illustrate how data sources work. So let's get started. So if you take a look, we've got the data source documentation. Not too incredibly complicated. Basically, we just specify data instead of resource. We then pass in the data source we want to use, give it a name, and then pass in any of the expected arguments. And if you scroll down, you'll see there are several different types, but we're going to keep it very, very simple. So what we want here is we want the public IPs available to us to be released. So we want to be able to see these and access them from within our state and eventually pipe those to an output. So let's go ahead real quick and see how this works. So here I am back in my console. I've actually closed out of the one connected to my instance. And let's go ahead and add this data source here down at the bottom. So we're just going to specify data. Azure RM underscore public underscore IP. MTC IP data is what we'll call it. That sounds good. Open and close some braces. And then the name equals Azure RM underscore public underscore IP dot MTC dash IP dot name. So what we're doing is we are querying the IP address we created up here. As you remember, the name MTC IP, we are querying that to get its IP address. Now, once again, we don't really need to do that because we're using the same state file. We just access it however we want or just access it just using our resource names. But if you, for instance, had another Terraform deployment without access to that state, then this is a way that we could do it. We could actually use a data source to access that IP within Azure without having to dig through the state file. So after that, it just wants a resource group name. And of course, that's going to be Azure RM underscore resource underscore group dot MTC dash RG dot name. Just as we've used many times before. So what this is going to do is find the IP address that matches these conditions. So now let's go ahead and see what this looks like in our state. And what I'm going to do, we actually don't need to apply again because this data source is not a resource. It doesn't need to be applied. All we need to do is a refresh. So we're still going to use the apply keyword, but we're not going to actually apply anything to Azure at all. So we'll run terraform apply dash refresh only. And as you can see, there are no changes, but we know we have made a change at least to our configuration file. So we do want to apply, apply complete. Let's now take a look in our state. Open that state up. You can see we actually have our new data source here. And if you scroll down, we've got the IP right there, right at the top, very easy to find. So if I run a Terraform state list, as you can see, we now have our data.azurempublicip.mtc-ip-data, which reflects this. So once we need to access that, we can access it using that. All right, so that's all for this lesson. Go ahead and mark it complete. Come on back to the next one and let's continue the course. We're going to add a nice little convenience feature to our script by utilizing outputs to display information that we need. As you well know, we've been manually finding the public IP address of our instance to verify it. 
Well, that is incredibly inefficient. So let's add an output to make that a lot easier. So as you can see here in the docs, we have output values. And basically all we need to do is say output, give that output a name, and then specify a value. It's pretty straightforward. Now keep in mind, outputs are only rendered when Terraform applies the plan. So just running a plan is not going to work. We do need to apply it. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. All right, so what I want is just an output to get our IP address. And instead of referencing the instance, I'm going to reference that nice little data source we created to keep things very simple. So output, and we'll just call that public underscore IP underscore address, just like so. Open and close those braces. And then we need to give that a value. Now what I'm going to do is use interpolation syntax and we're actually going to take a look at a couple different little features here. So first up, all of this will be in quotes. And what I want is I want the name of our MTC VM. So if that is MTC VM, I want MTC VM colon IP address, whatever that might be. So to get that, what we're going to do is use interpolation syntax. Once again, I said dollar sign in these curly braces, which allows us to utilize variables and reserved keywords within a quoted string. So what we're going to use is Azure RM underscore Linux virtual machine. Go ahead and tab through that dot mtc dash vm dot name just like so so that's going to give us our name now after that we're going to add a colon and a space and since those are outside of the interpolation syntax as you can see they are brown on my screen which means they are part of the string so once we've done that of course we could just use the same exact string dot public ip address but we're going to use our data source as i said so for that, we'll use data dot Azure RM underscore public IP dot MTC IP dash data dot IP underscore address. All right. And as you can see, if I run a Terraform state show and just pass this in this first part, you can see IP address is the attribute that we want. All right, so let's go ahead and run our Terraform apply dash refresh only and let's see what happens here. All right, as you can see, there have been changes to outputs and here's what we're going to get. Absolutely, we would love to do that. So yes, apply complete. So now what I can do is just run Terraform output. That gives us all of our outputs. If there are multiple, you can also ask for that output specifically, just like so. All right, perfect. So now every time we apply, we're going to get our MTC VM or the name of the VM that we've got, colon IP address. We're going to start optimizing our script and making it more dynamic by adding variables. So let's get started. Now, so far, we have been hard coding everything. As you know, our Windows SSH script, that is hard coded in. And then we've also got our interpreter here. Now, one thing that might change a lot as we move from station to station, computer to computer, Starbucks to Starbucks, is that we may be changing different operating systems. So it would be a lot nicer if we could dynamically choose which operating system to use based on which terminal we're using. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. As you know, We've got Windows SSH script and Linux SSH script. And then we've also got the Windows interpreter and the Linux interpreter. So let's go ahead and change this. And what I'm going to do is use interpolation again. And we're going to add var dot host underscore OS right here. 
So now what's going to happen is this is going to insert the value of whatever this variable is once we set it. So let's do that. And now let's go and define this variable for us. So now we could just add a variable right here in the same file, but let's go ahead and split off the variables file. So we're going to create a new file called variables.tf, just like so. And any TF file is going to be considered by Terraform on any apply as long as they're in the same directory. So I could have 27 different TF files or a TF file for every single resource output and everything else I want in their own separate files and Terraform would consider them all the same deployment. So we've got our variables.tf here. Let's go ahead and create that variable. So variable host underscore OS, just like so. Now let's open and close some braces there. And then we just need to provide a type. Now this is not required, but it's very friendly to your coworkers. This way they know what type of variable they need to specify. So that could be a map, a string, a number, just any other type that Terraform recognizes, you can specify here to help guide your coworkers to understand what variables should be set. So let's go ahead and save this. We have our variable declaration here. It is initialized, but it's not defined. And then let's go ahead and run a Terraform destroy. So Terraform destroy dash auto approve. And as you can see, it's asking me for that variable now. So any type of Terraform destroy, plan or apply, anything that modifies the state is going to ask for that variable if it is not defined anywhere. And we will look at more of that in the coming lessons. So let's go ahead and since I'm on a Windows machine, I'm just going to say Windows and hit enter. and everything was destroyed successfully. So now let's just run a Terraform plan just to show, and it asks once again for the variable. We've now seen how to initialize a variable and how to define it at the command line, but as we saw, that is not a great way to define variables when in automation as it requires dynamic input which is the opposite of automated. So in this lesson, we're going to look at a few other ways to define variables and which of those ways take precedence over the others. So let's get started. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is head into my variables.tf and we're going to add a default value. Now go ahead and add that default to whatever operating system you're using. I'm going to use Windows. And anytime I say Windows, you can use Linux. And anytime I say Linux, you can use Windows just to stay consistent. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. So right now that means that it will always use Windows or at least fall back to Windows. So what I'm going to do, because it's actually a little bit quicker, is I'm just going to use Terraform console. And then what I'm going to do is type var .host underscore os. All right, and as you can see, Terraform Console is a very handy tool that allows you to access anything within the state that you need. So now I'm going to exit out of that, going to head back to my variables.tf, and let's remove that default and run Terraform Console var.hostOS. And as you can see, it says known after apply. And that's because you will need to specify that variable when you apply, Terraform console isn't going to ask you. So now what we want to do, we want to define that another way. Let's go and add another file called terraform.tfvars. Now what this is, is a way to define our variables and it's also generally considered to be a sensitive file. You usually will not send this to your repository, but there are several cases where you will. So just keep that in mind. So within this, we can just define the host OS equals Windows just like so. So now if I run Terraform console and run var.hostOS, it's defined once again. Perfect. So as you see, terraform.tfvars is another way to define our variables. 
So now I'm going to exit out of there again, clear that. Now let's take a look at another way to define our variables. If we run a Terraform console dash var equals host underscore os equals Linux, let's see what happens. Var dot host underscore os is now Linux. So if the variable is defined on the command line, and you can use this dash var with terraform plan or terraform apply or even terraform destroy, then it will override whatever is set on terraform.tfvars. And terraform.tfvars will override what's set within variables.tf as the default. So let's go ahead and see another example real quick. Let's create another file. And I'm just going to call that, let's just say osx.tfvars. And even though that isn't one of our host OSs, let's go ahead and do that anyway. So we're going to say host underscore OS equals osx, just like so, and save that. And then let's run terraform console dash var dash file equals osx dot tf vars var dot host underscore os is now osx so as you can see we can utilize the var file argument here to override terraform dot tf vars which then overrides variables dot tf with the default setting all right so that is everything we now have a general idea of how variable precedence works within terraform and different ways to specify those variables. So now that we've managed to choose our SSH config file dynamically based on the definition of our host OS, we now need to make our interpreter dynamic. Unfortunately, this isn't as easy as interpolation syntax replacement, so we need to look at a better way. In this lesson, we're going to utilize conditional expressions to choose the interpreter we need dynamically based on the definition of the host OS variable. So let's get started. So as you know now, we are able to specify our host OS as a variable, which will then replace this and allow us to dynamically choose the SSH script that we use. Now we haven't applied this yet, but this works. So now let's see how to specify the interpreter appropriately which again, our other interpreter, which you may have if you're on Mac OS or Linux, and that's bash, comma, dash C, just like so. So if we're on Windows, we need to use this one. And if we're on Linux or Mac OS, we need to use this one here. So let's see how we can do that. So if we take a look in the docs, you can see essentially what we want is a condition, question mark, true value, or false value. It's essentially a ternary expression. So if we specify a variable, we then decide based on what that variable's definition is, whether it's going to be one item or a different item. And the second one is going to be the default. So let's just take a look at this in the console. And by console, I mean Terraform console. This is going to be a lot easier than trying to dig through and explain by dragging the mouse around on some documentation. So let's just say var dot host underscore os equals two equal signs there, Windows, which it does for me. And of course, if you're on Mac OS or Linux, use Linux there. We use our question mark. We're going to say PowerShell or bash, just like so. Let's go ahead and hit enter. All right, since our host to OS is set to Windows, it's reporting PowerShell. So now let's see what happens if we need to choose between these two. So all we need to do is var dot host underscore OS equals windows, choose between PowerShell command, just like so, or bash dash C. And if we hit enter, as you can see, it reports PowerShell dash command. Now, if you wanted to invert that, you could actually do a var dot host OS. If it does not equal windows, then return bash or return PowerShell. 
So as you can see, this is how you can invert that. But we don't need to invert it. We're actually going to use this one right here. So go ahead and copy that because we're going to need it very soon. Let's head up to our interpreter and let's actually paste that in now, just like so. All right, let's save that. Let's exit out of here. And then let's run our Terraform plan. And remember in my terraform.tfrs, I had my host OS defined there as Windows. All right, so everything is looking pretty good so far. So let's go ahead and run our Terraform apply auto approve. And let's make sure we get a new IP address and a machine to which we can log in. All right, all applied. As you can see, the public IP address actually did not get populated by the time this was done. I'm imagining that is some sort of a glitch here because it worked earlier. We've got our host IP address that actually shows up in our local exec provisioner here. So as you can see, everything looks like it went well, except for that one output. So let's go ahead. We can see this here, this IP. Let's run up to view and command palette. SSH connect to host. Scroll down to the bottom and well, that worked perfectly fine. We've got our IP address there. Let's log into it. That is a Linux machine. Continue. All right, and we are in. So as usual, let's see if Docker version is good to go yet. Docker is installed. It went a lot faster this time, so that is awesome. We can then open a folder if we'd like. We can open our home directory. Just like so, trust folder and continue. Run a terminal and now we have a full VS Code environment within our brand new virtual machine. So that is awesome. Could just go ahead and move that out of the way. Let's take a look here. And now that some time has passed, let's run Terraform Apply Refresh Only. And let's see if we can get that output to work. Remember, this is a data source. And what that means is that it is reaching to the Azure API and there's a good chance that that IP address just wasn't quite available within the API yet. So let's go ahead and run Terraform Apply Refresh Only. And this is a great way to troubleshoot things like this because this type of stuff happens all the time. Bam, look at that. So it looks like we are going to have an IP address after we have this refresh finished. So we're going to choose yes. And now it works. So if I type Terraform output, we've got our IP address. And then back over here, we also have our terminal ready to go. So now you have a reproducible development environment within Azure that you can deploy anytime you want, use for whatever you need, commit to a code repository or whatever, and destroy it. All right, so go ahead and you can close that. And if you are finished, run a Terraform destroy, auto approve, and that's everything. I hope you enjoyed the course. Feel free to reach out to me for any questions you may have. And don't forget to Terraform Apply Yourself.